All right, Mike, let's start right at the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about your family and your early life. Uh, well, I was born in Nebraska, grew up in Wyoming and Idaho, so the Northwest, a part of the country that most Americans don't know how to articulate. Uh, they think I'm from the Midwest, which is a very different place. Um, uh, Oil Can Harry's, it's great to be on this stage. It's the one place I've always felt comfortable in. It just reminds me of home, except for here we get to dance with the boys. Um, and uh, um, rodeos were a big part of my growing up. My first job was at a rodeo. It was the first time, I think, uh, it's where some fetish was instilled. I was assigning uh, horse stalls to cowboys. And um, they wore very tight pants, and they were all very fit, and it was, I didn't know what was going on, and there's rope and animals. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, like I said, I felt the weirdest thing about going to a gay rodeo is it looks exactly like a straight rodeo, except instead of women with giant hair and whatever, they're drag queens. Um, <laughs> so um, that was it. I grew up Mormon. Uh, my parents converted to being Mormon when I was like 10 years old. And that was uh, very s uh, significant. I really loved the church. I loved the, um, I loved protocol. I liked um, uh, a sense of community, um, all of those things. And I probably would be a big Mormon asshole right now if I weren't gay. So let's all be glad that I'm gay and not trying to force people to live a certain way. Um, I don't know if that's, is, is that where you were getting at, like where I was born at, or, you know. Um. Well, tell us a little bit about some of the things you used to do when you were out in, like, the gullies, or the, out on the, um, I don't know, in the tundra, or whatever it is. I'm, I'm from Chicago, what do I know of this, you know? So. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can just take public transportation and avoid the tundra in Chicago. Um, it was, it was a great place to grow up. I, I say that a lot. It was a great place to be um, a kid. I could just go out into the woods and it was safe and I could build forts and I could um, uh, alter streams and uh, do all kinds of fun stuff that uh, um, didn't get me landed in jail or anything like that. And it made me feel uh, connected to the earth and to, um, and it made me feel secure as a person. Like I had my own, like I built a fort and it was my place and it was, you know, I felt like it was mine, you know, and looking back as an adult, how ridiculous is that? But, you know, um, it, it, you know, so it, that was great to carry that into then life, knowing that I've, I had my, I had some capabilities and stuff. And that's the reason too, I was also in Boy Scouts and loved that. Uh, the knots came in very handy. Everybody's now asks like, <laughs> how did you learn all these knots? And I was like, Boy Scouts, most of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that double half hitch, always, that's the bed post one. But you said that growing up though in sort of relative isolation really affected your ideas about self-reliance. How do you mean? What does that mean to you? Oh. Um, well, self-reliance, I mean, in a practical manner is that we learned for fun, we would go camping in the winter. We would um, go to a place and we would uh, build a structure and sleep in it. And so I always knew if a, if a plane went down on a mountain, I'd be fine. You know, it would be easy. We would actually have a fuselage and stuff and like to make a thing with. We had to make it out of scratch. <laughs> and we have to learn how what to eat and what not to eat and that kind of thing. And um, we had to bring everything with us, although I think I still have this nagging. Um, I'm still, like, when it's packing, when I'm packing for a trip, I have all this, like, stress that still comes up because my scoutmasters are like, you will die if you don't pack the right things, you know. <laughs> Like, you won't be there, you know, but <laughs> um, but I did learn to pack the right things and to be prepared and to think ahead and 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 all that was all helped me get very organized, especially when it came to like having a lot of gear and all of that stuff. Then um, packing wasn't as it felt <laughs> even more important than life or death. 
um, when you're packing for a leather event, right? You know, you, you have to make decisions, toys or clothes, you know, it's like, <laughs> that all started in Boy Scouts as a kid in Wyoming, I guess. Let's take, let's take one step back. Um, depict for us, if you would, some of the tenets of Mormonism, because I think that's a very misunderstood religious group. So what did it mean to you? Um, well, without going into like the, the, the dogma, the, the practicality of it is that you had something to do on every day. On Monday night, it's family home evening. On Tuesday night, it's scouts. On Wednesday night, mom's gone because it's, it's the women's thing. It's Relief Society. And then there was always something to do and everything fit together and it was interchangeable. It was like Denny's, you know, you just if you go to any Mormon church anywhere, it's exactly the same <laughs> and you can fit in. Um, and... Uh, so, but it, it also, um, there's a lot about family, um, and, uh, you know, um, <laughs> but for us, for my family, it was, we were kind of, you know, I don't think living a lie, but we were pretending. I mean, my parents were divorced, but we never mentioned that my, I was born with a different mother, and so, um, but we were all white, so we could, like, fake it, but it was, <laughs> but my mom that I grew up with was 4'10", and my dad was only 5'9", and all the height came from my birth mom's side, who I'm still close with, but we never mentioned Delene when we were with Patsy, and when we were with Patsy, she was mom, and Delene was Delene, and when I was with Delene, mom was Patsy, and, and, and mom was mom, and I figured that's the world I lived on, so... Um, that was all very confusing for an eight-year-old to navigate. So having, um, it's probably one of the real reasons I still just really hold on to protocol. Protocol means a lot to me. And the church had a lot of protocol. And so, and I think that that um, is something that I liked. I, I loved men's only events. <laughs> and the Mormons have plenty of them. Uh, you know, you go to a priesthood, you go to the general priesthood meeting, and then you go to the breakout priesthood meetings, and then you have scouts, and you have all these times to be with, you know, a bunch of guys. And there was all this, like, shaking hands and looking into each other's eyes, and I really looked forward to, like, shaking certain guys' hands. It, like, became like a fetish for me right there. I think that's why I still like wearing leather gloves and shaking hands. Does that answer your question, or? Okay. I can't help but ask, doesn't Mormonism frown upon divorce? How did your family navigate that situation? Well, simple. We were converts. We were reborn. You could just, you know, all of that's gone. Once you go, you know, you come in, you go into the water, you wear all white, and you go under the water, one person, you come out, you're all brand new and fresh. So, <laughs> kind of like a flogging. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So you, you told me that you came out very young and you discovered the gay scene in, in some places that, of course, most of us would never consider, <clears throat> excuse me, such as parks, gullies, the restroom of a library, a bowling alley. Tell us a little bit about all of that. Um, and I did write this down in a memoir. It's called Drama Club. It's on Amazon if you want to find it. <laughs> um, and I sent it to my parents who have responded in a really odd way. They've just really opened up about their stuff. Um, I just want to put that in there before I start telling you at 14. Um, I went to the library. I mean, that, I guess maybe that summer I was like working at the, at the rodeo. And then I was on this junior uh, bowling league. And uh, the bathroom was situated in just a way, it's one of those perfectly cruisy bathrooms. You go down a hall and then another hall and you go in and you open a door and it makes noise and then there's another door. You know, there's all these warning systems that people are coming. And then there was um, this, my first ever glory hole that I saw. And with literally all this writing on the walls, meet here for this, it was all very specific, you know, and it made me, um, I could go in there and read the stuff and jerk off and then go, bowl a frame and come back and um, that's the first time I uh, I don't think it's I don't know sex I, I when I was a kid with other another boy my age we did some stuff but we never we were it's prepubescent stuff um, 
this is probably the first time. I don't really remember the very, very first time. I remember the first time I saw a hard dick through a glory hole. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe I'm so lucky. And it's like, this, I mean, how could this be happening? And there's this hole here and I can see this guy, you know? It's like, you know, like he has no idea I was on the other side. Um, <laughs> until it came through and I freaked out and I ran out, uh, came back, thought about it all week and then went back the next week. Um, so it was bowling alleys and then, um, and this is what happens when there's shame and people marginalize people. There wasn't a gay bar. There wasn't any place for us to connect as queer people, as gay men. Um, and so the park was uh, another place, um, the tea rooms and the local community even like had a tea room of the month t-shirt they would give to the person who was seen the most often <laughs> in, in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> we. <laughs> We, uh, and the, the library, another place, you know, 14 year olds just naturally hang out. And um, at the end of the, um, in the history section, at the end of that, there is a bathroom. And that's where I learned um, how to come standing up. Um, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so that's, that's where that was happening. And then I had friends on like sleepovers. We were jerking each other off. Um, I tell other people these stories and nobody has these other stories. Um, <laughs> my boyfriend doesn't have any of these stories. Um, but it, I don't know why, but we were, there was a bunch of, um, uh, so that happened. Um, when I was 15, I went to Hawaii to pick pineapples. And while I was away from town, my parents moved to uh, to Pocatello, Idaho, and I thought I um, I came back, and then they found this letter I was writing to a gay guy, and um, that's how I came out to them, um, and it was bad. And so my straight year in high school, I tried to not be gay, and uh, it's the only time in my life I've ever been suicidal, um, and. Um, at the end of that summer, I met Bart Barney, and we hooked up. Um, he was another boy my age. Um, and I just said, I don't know what's going on with the church, but um, this is so right that I can't you know, leave it behind me. And then after Bart, there was Kelly and Michael and Sean Overrocker and you know, <laughs> all these uh, guys. We had like all this drama, and that's the reason I called that book Drama Club, because we had a lot of drama with each other. Um, and, uh, so that was, that was up to high school for me. I don't Okay. <laughs> well, when you were very young though, <clears throat> I don't know what's with my voice today. Someone mentored you when you were very young and they, they, they taught you what being gay meant. Please yeah. tell us about him. Okay. I'm so glad we did that <laughs> conversation first. Yes. RL. Um, it's, you know, Wyoming, so we have to have letter names, RL. And um, he was an older man. He was like 35. And um, I wanted to have sex with him, and we, would ha we had sex. But then he started insisting on talking to me about police, about STDs, about um, San Francisco, about, you know, um, this uh, thing there's not a cure for in San Francisco right now. Um, to, I don't even know if it was called GRID then. Um, and RL was a godsend. He um, taught me about sex. He taught me about the community. He taught me about bathhouses. He gave me this whole like rundown on like, you know, what, you know, if you don't want to hook up with somebody, just tell them you're just resting and blah, 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 and like all these different things people might say to you, although I've never heard Greek passive and Greek active, but that never came up. He told me that might be a way of so talking about top, bottom, I don't know, if, um, anyway. Um, and I just have a really, really fond uh, memories of him and, um, uh, you know, he just watched me flutter around and um, I ripped out his heart a little bit and I regret that. Um, and he's dead now. Um, he didn't die of AIDS. He died from a good old fashioned uh, brain tumor um, back in uh, 1985 when I had moved to San Diego. But uh, thanks for asking about RL because um, Without that, I don't know what I would have done. I didn't have internet. I didn't have other gay friends. I didn't have anything except for the writing on the bathroom walls. 
which was awesome, but it, you need, it did nobody, you know, I don't know. Well, since we're on the topic of mentoring a little bit there, what, l let's jump to your thoughts on mentoring within the community. What do you think of that? I think it's um, one of the best things that can come out of the community. It's family, you know, it's, um, I've chosen uh, my mentors and uh, um, uh, they're very important to me. And um, I, uh, I've dubbed one of them, you know, my um, father, you know, my, the father that, my dad is awesome, he's a great guy, he's super, super great, but he can't tell me what it's like to date another man. He can't tell me what it's like to do a BDSM scene, you know, he can't, you know, um, but the mentors that I have chosen, especially um, one of them is, uh, you know, can, can help me with all those things. So uh, that's, that's really, really important. I think it's important to let the mentee pick the mentor. Um, part of my, the chip on my shoulder now is like while I was running for titles, I had a lot of people picking me, <laughs> telling me that they were going to tell me how it works. Um, I had three or four of those, and I wasn't interested, and I was trying to figure it out and needing help, and people were glomming onto me that I didn't actually even want their help or need their help, but they were going to mentor me whether I liked it or not. Um, disagree with that kind of mentoring. You mentioned that you moved to San Diego. You actually went there to dance ballet. Please tell us about that. So um, I like to say I left the Mormon cult to join the ballet cult, um, and there was a lot of structure. It was awesome. You know, you come in, there's a ballet master or a ballet mistress, and their rule is law, and I loved that. I also loved um, uh, the movement and doing something as a group where you feel like you're part of this whole synchronized um, organism, and that was always very, very, very satisfying. And, you know, it makes your body amazing, and <laughs> uh, th there was, th that was important too. Um, but, um, and I, I pursued that in San Diego. Um, it got me out of Idaho. I was, I was going to leave and go to Pacific Northwest. There was this whole conversation with my ballet teachers in Idaho. I ended up going to San Diego, and uh, they were right. There were other things to do for me to do <laughs> if I decided not to do ballet. Um, but ballet was uh, probably one of my first uh, fetishes. There's gear, you wear the tights and the shoes and the, the whole deal, dance belts. Um, I, I loved it all. Loved the smell of the theater, making magic happen on stage um, and all of that. But then I auditioned for the Royal Winnipeg Ballet and they said I could enter their school, but I also found out that year I was HIV positive. It was 1987. And everybody told me you got max two years to live. So I, I um, in retrospect, since I didn't die, um, part of that was a gift because I still had this like lingering thing with the Mormon church. What do I do with that? And um, uh, now it was an academic. <laughs> You're going to be dead in six months to two years. And I just looked for, you know, I saw where the love was coming from, and it wasn't coming from any organized religion at that time. In fact, organized religion is saying, this is what you get for being a homosexual. You die a horrible, painful, humiliating death, and you brought it on yourself. So I'm like, that's not my message. I need to hear from other people. And then just, it, and it was all queer people. And, and I mean the whole gamut of queer people um, stepping up to help those of us who were suffering from the AIDS. Um, I kind of went all over the place with that, so I'll just hand it back to you. Okay. Well, you, you've brought up HIV and uh, being diagnosed in 1987. That was a very tumultuous time, especially to receive that kind of a diagnosis. So how did you confront these things being said to you? six months to two years to live. This had to be overwhelming. So how did you manage that and how did you get through it? 
Um, to be honest, I think my memory is when I found out I was HIV positive, I was so overwhelmed that I was grateful that I had a ballet class to go to like right after picking up my results. Again, it was the, it was a structure. It was, all of that helped me just keep, keep, um, staying into that. But how did I handle it? Um, I didn't, I was panicked. I, I didn't know what to do. My, my roommate didn't know what to do. My roommate was, um, an older man. <laughs> he was 40. Um, cause I was 20. <laughs> Uh, we are still friends, I, uh, Dominic. I, um, uh, and he's a lovely man. And he's still alive and still around. Um, uh, how did I deal with it? That's an interesting question. I just, I think I used a lot of denial. I'll do the, I'll go to the doctors. I'll do whatever. But I just, I'm just going to live my life. Although I didn't accept the invitation to the Royal Winnipeg Ballet in Canada because it was Canada and I was going to have to work under the table. I wouldn't be a, a legal citizen and all these other things and so health care and all that stuff came up for me. And so I really just thought I was going to die. So I came back to San Diego and I just thought I'll just party until I die. <laughs> and like three years later I was like drunk all the time and high all the time. <laughs> Um, my best friend died, my boyfriend died, my, um, soon after that somebody, another mentor of mine died, um, and I was just going, okay, I guess I don't get to die like everybody else, and just being a messy drunk all the time isn't working out, so, um, I got sober. I stopped drinking and doing drugs altogether. I mean, I didn't even do poppers. Um, for 25 years, um, yeah, uh, two and a half years ago, I decided to dip my feet back in and I'm drinking and smoking, smoking pot again. And so far the world hasn't stopped, but that's my story, um, without getting into <laughs> sobriety. Um, but yeah, the way I dealt with it was to just, you know, uh, plan on dying. And part of planning on dying was like, why finish college? <laughs> You know, still don't have a college degree. Um, you know, but because of those choices, though, um, I have this experience uh, that is other, that everybody in here can understand, <laughs> maybe being the other. And I think it makes me a better older man. I'm 53 now, and I'll be 54 next month. And I feel really centered having tasted so many um, experiences that life has to offer. Okay. Tell us how you came into the leather kink scene. Um, I, uh, like I said, the cowboys were like amazing to me. Uh, that was, seemed great. Uh, but, um, the leather kink scene, well, there was one par party in particular. It was a butt boy party. It was a Tom of Finland party. It was on Sh what's now Schrader Boulevard near where the Gay and Lesbian Center is. Um, and I knew I wanted that. That was a really amazing party. We don't have very many like that. Uh, we walked in. I remember first you had to sign a release. That was amazing. <laughs> this, absolutely. I want to see what's happening in here. Um, I, I went in and they had all these Tama Finland uh, uh, pieces, like big art pieces all around. There was a dance area. But then I went back and I saw everything. I just saw um, boot blacking. There was a guy on a table being, getting, being completely shaved. They had gear for sale. They, um, and then <laughs> when you think you've seen it all, you just kept going. And there was a smoking area. And then there was a room where I looked through, there was like these portals. And there was like this round bench and there was like five guys in there, like all white guys, all completely shaved, all like, like rubbing oil on each other. It's like, awesome, you know, keep going. And then there was like art for sale. Oh, a silent auction. Of course, <laughs> we're gay, you know. <laughs> it was all erotic art stuff. But then like this, uh, then outdoors there was a play. Uh, then I saw a piss scene happening and that was really amazing. And... Um, that's when I had my really first, I was standing on like a platform, maybe it was like almost a little bit lower than this, 
Um, I had gotten some boots. I was like wearing a harness. I had bought myself uh, a mirror cap. And um, this guy, beautiful guy, comes over and puts his, um, just leans onto my calf. And I just instinctively like stroke his head. And he says, thank you, sir. And I was like, oh my God. That was like, that was like a God moment, right? It's just like, this is where I belong. This is amazing. He's saying thank you to me? <laughs> you know, that's, wow. Um, and then it even went back farther and there was all these people fucking and um, uh, that, that was awesome. Um, so that was a, a party that got me into it. But I kept then going to these parties and not telling any of my regular friends I was doing it. And um, kink was happening in my bedroom and I didn't really realize it. You know, it's like, you know, choking and spanking and dom-sub stuff. It just sounded, I thought it was just sex. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, you know, some of my sober friends were telling me that I was, like, acting out, that my behavior was, like, off the rails. Um, and so I just kind of stopped telling them about it, and I was basically a closeted kinky person. Um, and, but, um, anyway, until I came to this, this place where I was two-stepping, and Oil Can Harry's, my country roots that I understood about, that was really, really me, was having a leather contest. And I thought, oh, maybe if I just get into that leather contest, I'll get more visibility, and I can get some more guys who are interested in this sex that my other friends are telling me is bad sex, I can find more of those guys and have that kind of sex with them. That was my whole reason for entering the Oil Can Harry's Leather Contest. But why, why that party of all things in, in the whole city? Why did you choose to go there? You know, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know how I got there, to be honest. Um, I don't know if I saw, like, a poster at 665 on Santa Monica Boulevard or if it was a flyer or, or what, you know. Um, I went with my, ex, uh, with my boyfriend at the time who was uh, about eight years older than me, so maybe he just he knew about it. Um, he had had a leather past, but just AIDS and all that stuff like really was tied into his, it was super, super painful for him. He was in a poly relationship and then when somebody died, it like altered their stuff and then they wanted to stay together, but without the third, it didn't work. Um, and um, so he had a lot of grief around um, leather and it just didn't evolve, open up with him. Um, uh, but for me, then I just realized this is what I want to do. You know, this is it. And about the same time, protease inhibitors came out, and um, at least I knew my, my numbers had been going down, down, down. I officially had AIDS, but then they had come up. Nobody knew what that meant, you know, and they were going up, up, up. Like, and after a year, I'm like, I'm, maybe we're not going to die. And if we're not going to die, I'm not just going to sit on the couch and, like, watch Melrose Place until for the rest of my life, which was, which was, seemed to me the option with that particular partner. Anyway, so I quit seeing him and I, and I uh, uh, at least came out to myself that I was kinky. And um, it was probably another, it was a few more years before I entered the leather contest. You spoke earlier about the Mormon church and the structure that that afforded you. You were able to parlay that into the leather community. Tell us what you did with that. What the Boy Scouts taught you, oh, yeah. what, what the, the elders of the church and the other people, the men's group taught you. Yeah, yeah. You were able to take a lot of that and use it and, par and, and apply it elsewhere. Oh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Um, a big, huge, uh, there's rituals, serious rituals. Uh, one of the rituals is the laying on of hands. That's where, you know, you sit in a chair, similar to this one, you know, people with the authority um, of the Melchizedek priesthood or whatever it is that um, uh, put their hands on you and then they say a prayer and something happens and you are then officially a member, uh, you are you're either you have the Amaronic priesthood or you have the Melchizedek priesthood or you have whatever, you're a deacon, you're a teacher, you're a priest, whatever, you have been ordained to do that. 
Um, and um, I'm happy to say that something like that now happens after leather contests in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, and um, I, um, we tried some other things. I wanted some ritual that like brought the new title holder in. We tried some other things that didn't work. Like <laughs> we passed this gift, or we stood in a circle, and we passed this gift around and gave him the. And then he was like confused and walking around, and nobody could hear us. And um, what I'm trying to say is, you might not get it right the first time if you start trying to introduce ritual, so to keep trying. <laughs> and we finally um, uh, came up with this. I'm like, what if we all just, the outgoing title holder looks into the new title holder's eyes, tells him whatever he needs to hear because it's about that house, it's about Oak and Harry's, it's about, you know, sanctuary, whoever. They just like say, you know, blah, 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 you're now part of this, and then everybody makes a huge mm, roaring sound and um, he is then part of it. And yeah, I think, um, yeah, th then I got to learn practical skills on how to, you know, survive in the wild and tie knots and um, hold a meeting and um, <laughs> those kinds of things. Why did you come to Los Angeles? Why here? Uh, Los Angeles was basically crash landing out of a relationship. Um, <clears throat> I was in San Diego. Um, I wasn't a ballet dancer anymore, and the guy I was dating at the time uh, went from being a law school student to an attorney. Um, we got along when we were both <laughs> when he was a law school student. Uh, but that put us in Orange County. I would like to say I did nine months of time in Orange County in Dana Point um, with an attorney, and I was just like scratching my eyes out. I just wasn't um, built to be a housewife in Orange County. And um, uh, we got into a huge argument. Um, oddly enough, this seems like a non sequitur, and I still haven't got it figured out, but it's when I got AZT pills. This is before. And introducing, showing that there was evidence. Before that, there wasn't a pill to take. So my HAV was just this existential thing. And then um, when I had pills in the house, we both got super agitated and, and we started fighting, arguing all the time. And um, we figured, <laughs> I think we both lied to ourselves and said, the problem is that you're commuting to LA all the time. So if we live in LA, that'll solve all of our problems. And of course it didn't. And um, so when we broke up, I was bartending, I was barbacking at Revolver in, in West Hollywood. And so that's how I got to Revolver. I, I mean, that's how I got to LA. I had a suitcase, one pair of tennis shoes, and um, I only ate after the bartenders tipped me at the end of my shift. Wow. So that's how, that, that was my glamorous landing in Los Angeles. <laughs> well, tell us about the LA Band of Brothers. How did that come about? Well, the, LA Band of Brothers, I mean, this gets back to mentoring. And I felt like a lot of people who, quite frankly, had never been in a contest were telling me how to be in a contest. And they were telling me all kinds of things, like don't have a drink in your hand, don't be seen having sex in a bar, and all these things, and I was really confused. I said, I thought, I didn't think I was running for um, Miss Mormon Utah, I thought I was <laughs> running for Mr. Leather Kinky Sex Guy. So, and all of our bar titles are like, you know, 80% of them are like bar titles. So why can't we have a drink in our hands? I didn't even drink at the time and it still bothered me. Um, and <laughs> they were, um, uh, so, um, and it was really my, uh, David Scannick gets, <laughs> credit for this, I was lamenting this, like, and then I saw it too, when I, after I'd won IML and I'd gone all over the place and I'd seen all these different communities, I really, I did see one, I stayed in a house that was a duplex, we were on the top, and underneath there was a guy with a place and he had dungeon, and I saw him meet up with this guy in the bar, and this guy was very, very fresh and young, and, um, and he ended up, anyway, I don't know what happened, I really don't know. Uh, but my take the next day was this guy ended up doing things that he didn't want to do. You know, he, he went farther because he was, a, he was running for a title and he wanted experience. He wanted to talk to like somebody, you know, a real person, you know, that's actually doing the stuff that we're talking about. And um, 
And I thought, and who else is this guy going to turn to? So that's what I thought. Um, David says, well, you guys should unionize. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, title holders should have it like a title holder community. And so um, that's why we started the LA Band of Brothers. And because, yeah, I come from that like Mormon background or whatever, it needs to be very specific. I wasn't okay with like, oh, it's gray. Whoever wants to join can join. It's like, no, anybody who's competed for the Mr. Los Angeles leather title is a LA Band of Brothers member. I don't get to decide. Nobody in the LA Band of Brothers gets to decide. Um, it's you get to decide. If you decide to join this, get, be in this contest, and you decide, you just need to be in it. You don't have to place or anything. You just have to compete. And that's, that, that makes you eligible to be in the LA Band of Brothers. Um, and so um, it's, 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 it's really helped um, turn things from the title holders being um, the fresh group of lemmings. I was just watching this documentary before I came here. Lemmings are basically the, the hamburgers of the, of the Northwest. <laughs> just all the other predators eat them. And um, that's what the uh, new title holders were. And that stopped happening. Now they could like turn to somebody, they could turn to people who run for a contest. And um, that made me feel awesome. And we had our ritual and, and different things, and, and I, that's, that's how it came to be. And I'm, I'm, I'm still really happy that um, uh, that, that occurred. Well, is the Band of Brothers still a very active organization, still very successfully operating? Um, I think that it's very active. Um, one thing you should know, I've been basically unplugged from the title system for about a year and a half now. I went to IML, not, well, two years ago, I decided not to go to IML just to give it a break. It was my 10-year anniversary, and everybody's like, well, you got to go. It's your anniversary. I go, yeah, but somebody else is going to win. It's not about me. <laughs> and um, um, it was a very special weekend for me because I met somebody, like, you know, at an A-gay pool party who turned out to be a perfect fit for me. <laughs> Um, turned out to like protocol, turned out to like, you know, be willing to do some of these other things that we do. And I was like, wow. And I've been to IML nine times, and that has not happened. <laughs> nine times. Well, except for the first year. I got a serve for a year and a half out of the first one. Um, um, after that, um, I, you know, and all of these uh, contests, I wasn't getting laid, you know. And I wasn't finding sex, um, so um, that's one of the reasons. And then finding it, it's easy for me to find kinky sex away from those places. So I'm finding all my kinky sex other places. And then um, the way that the contest system has evolved, um, it just doesn't feel like a place for for me right now. It's 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 a little too broad. And um, it's, uh, it's non-specific. Like, you know, I've been talking about that, I guess, all through this whole interview. Um, uh, you know, that's a problem. And I don't want to diminish the joy that people are getting from the contest system. I had it. It feels great to win something. It feels great to go through a crucible with a whole bunch of other people. Um, it's, it's a scene all to itself. But it's... Um, very little actual kink happening in the um, leather scene. So, in, in the leather title holder scene. But speaking of the title holder circuit, the, the title holder scene, what drew you to that? What made well, you compete? Well, the thing that made me compete, like I said, I wanted to get on this stage and get up here in front of all these guys and saying, I like to hit people and get hit and, 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 um, uh, and <laughs> you know, have people crawl on their knees and say, give me more, and say, do you want it? I can't hear you. I don't beg for it. I don't believe you. I'm not going to give it to you until you beg for it. I wanted to meet people like that. Country people are very nice. You know, you don't want to do that. And um, <laughs> You know, being a whore is a bad thing. Um, so um, the reason I competed, well, was that, and 
um, after I won this contest and I saw this community, it was, it was um, uh, um, it was something attractive to me. And so then I started reading all the books. The Leather, you know, The Leather Man's Handbook, Guy Baldwin's books, like all these books. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I want some of that. I want a club that you need to petition to be in and not everybody makes it. Like this, these, this what I n understand now is a fantasy or not, I don't know. Nobody, Guy Baldwin's the only person I've talked to, a guy and race and uh, race Bannon um, and a couple other guys who were actually old enough to be there. And, um, you know, it sounds like we've created this fantasy, kind of like a Santa Claus idea of like what's actually happening. Um, and for whatever reason, these, um, the clubs, the way that they're described in our, uh, I would call it our scriptures, <laughs> Um, are um, occur about as mi as often as the stories in the Bible happen <laughs> in modern times, uh, and um, I slowly, after year after year after year after year, saw that. I'm like, there's not a club of hot guys that are doing their own thing in private that I can just like find one of them and say, look, I want to petition you guys, what do I have to do? And then they tell me what I have to do and like I will meet them and then they allow me to like come to a group and then meet them and then maybe after that I can then finally start to play with them. That is what I was looking for and I have never found it. Um, <laughs> that sounds really horribly depressing, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> but but it's it's the truth for me and I can find it in little pieces. You know, I had an amazing party, but you know what? I put it together. It was a very, very private party in a dungeon space in Long Beach. And um but I've anyway, it seems to me now like all this stuff that I want to attend is under the radar. All the public stuff is fun, but it's like a rodeo. It's not like a, a, um, a, a fetish sex thing. You know, I don't leave events in the United States feeling the same way as I do leaving events like in Berlin, you know. Well, what do you think was your key to success with the local contests and then winning IML? Um, well, I think I had something to say. Um, I, uh, um, oddly enough, was like my speeches, both at LAL and IML, were about um, were about inclusivity, <laughs> about um, uh, recognizing um, gentlemen. It is unlikely we'll ever win the um, war of tolerance until we're able to tolerate those who are different among our own kind. That was the opening. That was a Guy Baldwin um, uh, quote, and and I meant it. Um, but I thought that um, we came together like at the rodeo, where it's like I have my brand, you have your brand, you have your brand. You know, you have your cattle, you have your house, you have your farm, and um, instead of what it seems like we are now, it's like one big thing. And if you don't agree to everything that's happening, you're on the outside. And I believe that diversity means that we're different. <laughs> that we have men's only spaces, we have women's only spaces, we have all these things that we argue about all the time. But we continually argue about them all the time. And um, to, to the point now, I, I want to be woke, I want to be, um, uh, uh, um, what I want to say is um, social justice and fairness is very, very, very important to me. Um, but so is diversity. And um, uh, 
which means there should be different places for different different places. That's not the question you asked. <laughs> the question is like, why did you, how did I do well is I had something to say. And yeah, I could stir the pot like that. I'm very much like, you know, you know, let's face it. Why do you have Guy Baldwin come and speak at your event? Do you think he's going to come and tell you how everything's perfect? No. <laughs> he's going to say, this is where we need work. This is where we need work. This is where we need work. And um, that's, I, I kind of did similar things. Um, I was also, um, uh, compared to the other cont contestants, um, classically, um, uh, wh what do I want to say? I was like, I was built, you know? I was 10 pounds more than I am now of muscle, and um, I was actually a little worried about that. I didn't look like the other contestants. And uh, it wasn't hairy. I wasn't big. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, the current media um, makes a body like the one I had then like the body to have. So I think that affected the judges. Um, and then I could articulate things. And I also had a job in local government. And I think that impressed people that I was working for the leader of a city. And, you know, and I could um, put thoughts together and organize and, anyway, write essays about leather carpetbaggers and things like that. Um, I think that's, that's why I did well. It's a contest. It's a beauty contest. Just like any pageant. It's the exact same thing. Um, and I... Um, prepared myself to be on stage. I got tons and tons and tons of help. And um, about half of it I asked for, the other half just came. And that's where I have to give Los Angeles a lot of credit. I did not know what was going on. And people are just showing up when I'm like, you know, I don't have this kind of boots. And then all of a sudden those boots are in front of me. Um, so that's what it's like to be a con contestant here in Los Angeles going to IML as opposed to these other places who win a bar contest and then they go, those poor guys, I feel so bad for them. You know, yeah, you know, it, it's hard. So um, I think I did well because I uh, wasn't afraid to say what I felt and um, I, t I picked a topic, inclusivity, as opposed to some, that you could sum up in 90 seconds as opposed to a topic like um, domestic abuse in the leather community, which is, you can't do that in 90 seconds. Don't pick that as your, your, your speech topic. It's, it's a really important one, but you can't do it in 90 seconds. Um, I don't know. I'm going to stop talking about that. <laughs> Have you any regrets about your year as IML? Um, Yes, my regrets aren't, aren't saying, we need to close this down now because that guy's looking at me. <laughs> and I want to fuck him. <laughs> I have those regrets of like spending way too minute, much time in interviews and less time having sex. And that, I really do regret that. My last IML, not this year, but the, the year Chuck died, I, I just had to go. And, and I went and I literally, I missed two interviews and, um, and it's funny, people are just like, not two, people are just like, well, I guess we're not going to have time. And people are thinking, didn't say, oh, because I'm, like, uh, I'm going to you know, this dungeon to, to play tonight, so I don't have time tonight. Instead of them saying, oh, I see, they're like, well, you need to make time if you want this to happen. I'm like, you're misunderstanding what this event is about yeah. to me. But now I do know what this event is about, and it's about title holders, and it's about... Um, the whole machine around title holders, and um, it's a theme. Fetish is a theme, but it's not the main event. You alluded a little bit ago to extensive travels when you were IML. You mentioned Berlin. Tell us a little bit about the leather kink scene. <clears throat> Sorry, my, <clears throat> my voice is not holding up today for some reason. But Tell us a little bit about the leather kink scene that you experienced in Europe, because it's completely different from what we know. Um, yeah, it's, it's very different in the sense that um, people are allowed to have sex in bars. Um, um, 
Um, I'm, uh, I don't know, it, it doesn't make it, <laughs> I can't get this out of my mind, I'll just say it, I was in the middle of having sex with someone, and um, uh, while we were, there was a dungeon in this place I was staying, so we were doing some things, and he got a text, <laughs> and his friend had texted him, he's like, and at the time I was with a sir, and I was being very um, passive at the time, and his friend is like, he's <laughs> sub, and he had like been showing up like as a sub, and um, uh, anyway, they just very, they, that communication I thought was very nice of his friend, like to give him that intel, like in the middle of the, our time together. Um, but the difference is, I love the Germans, not just because I have a German last name, but um, their attitude towards sex is everybody has sex. Let's just regulate it and make sure that it's as safe as possible. Um, and so forget all of that. What I love about the Berlin is they're very, very specific. I went to a sports biker fisting club and everybody was in there was in sport biker gear and they were into fisting <laughs> and it was huge it had the big fr top room and then two other rooms and um you know and so you know i was in there i'm actually not a really big fister but i love bike gear and all that stuff and it was amazing so i was like way in the back and they were giving me you know taking me all over places i was iml at that time and a big difference so that's the way they're having sex you know they're having sex very specifically like that and if you go to a sneaker night it's going to be all about sneakers it's not going to take everything else off it's just your sneakers that's all we care about and you if you're not if you're wearing boots nope it's sneakers tonight <laughs> you know they and you can't get in um and uh I, I, I love that. I, something crossed my mind while I was thinking of that I wanted to talk about, but I can't remember. Um, something about them being specific. I don't remember. I guess they, they did have a problem for a while with, this, with the dark rooms in Berlin, but being very German, they figured out they just weren't regulated. Then once they said, you have to be able to clean the wall for two, from two meters down, and there needs to be a drain, and there needs, to be to uh, there needs to be things to clean your hands with, now we're okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the difference. Yeah, and, and because they're able to have sex everywhere, um, the Folsom event, the street event, n almost no play is happening on the street, none whatsoever, um, that I saw my year. And it was, and everybody's in amazing gear, because first of all, it's cooler, and you can wear a bunch of leather and all of that. And um, uh, they're just like, if you want to have sex, you can go to that bar, or that bar, or that bar, you know. But it's not like, we're just like, I feel like we are like little tiny, like, dogs that we've like domesticated into like they're just these crazy animals that just bark all the time and do all that stuff we're that way sexually and we show up that way to Folsom it's like one day of the year we get to do this and we're just out of our fucking minds <laughs> and they get to do it all the time so like there's just like healthy attitude towards sex and they don't you know, and then they have other cues about like what is friendly and what is romantic like, um, uh, this guy walked me to the train and said, oh, he walked you to the train. That's a sign. I'm like, what? It's like, yeah, it's like, otherwise it's just, bye. Um, I don't know. They were very cool, too. This one guy, I was over there for 10 days, and on the fourth, third day, I met this guy right off the bat. He was actually in the military. He was like 6'4". He was constantly in gear, always wanted to fuck me. It was awesome. Um, but after four days of that, I'm like, there's a lot of other Germans here. And I, I said, you know, I got all, I kind of hem hawed around it. I'm like, you know, I'd like to just kind of like hang out with other people. And he's like, oh, that's totally cool. See you later. And he just took off. It's like no scene. Um, that's very different than my experience in LA. <laughs> so, I don't know. Okay. Well, when we were preparing for this interview, you passionately spoke about tremendous changes that are happening within the realm of radical sex. What are your thoughts on that? A lot of the things going underground, things are very PC. Tell us your thoughts on that. Well, this is where I'm gonna to try to be honest and not be an asshole. Um, <laughs> um, 
to me, again, too, this gets back to like, I like my little boxes. I like the men's contest to be about men. <laughs> I like the women's contest to be about women. I, you know, um, and we've, we're not there now. There were two corsets and high heels on stage. Was it last year or the year before? The last contest that I went to. And great. Um, but that's, now we're not in my fetish area. I'm, I'm very, you know, the only women I've ever been attracted to look like men. <laughs> Shirley, <laughs> Christy McNichol, somebody goes, oh, she doesn't count. Um, there's this woman who danced here. She's an amazing lead. I get really weirdly attracted to her, but she's like, she's got great arms and she's, you know, um, I don't know why I'm bringing all that up except for I'm allowed to be a gay man. I'm just saying that because I don't think a lot of people in the community understand that. At, at Emsel, I was constantly being told, yeah, well, have sex, it's not the same, you know, it's like, we'll just, yes, I get it, but for me, um, fetish is sexual for me. And if I'm being whipped by you or flogged by you or any of these things, I still, it's still a, it's still a sexual thing for me and I'm fully gay. I mean, I'm a gold star gay, I've never had, you know, sex with a woman. And I know I don't need to have it to like figure it out. Um, I'm just saying that there's that kind of attitude that I should, Mike Gurley, you should feel different. You should be more open to other things. And I am open to other things. I want to celebrate um, puppy play, you know, but maybe I'm going to like, you know, say at my event, it, my private event for sure, no puppies because there's, it's non-consensual scene. We can, that's a whole other thing. But um, I th consent is really, really important to me. Um, and I'm, I'm dancing around what I really want to say is um, Mr. and Leather are two words that are in the Mr. Los Angeles Leather title contest name. And I just, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted from conversations about whether that should include um, uh, non M male people. Um, just for the record, I'm just like anybody who identifies as male is male to me. But I want you to identify as male in the men's contest. I don't care what your gender origins are, when you're in this contest, you are identifying as, as a man into um, leather fetish sex. And the contests now are more about um, how much money did you raise for um, an organization who would, um, doesn't care about us, like kids and things like that, when, um, you know, I, I'm glad to see that we're starting to raise more money for the Leather Archives or the Woodhill Foundation or these other things that actually serve us, um, rather than apologizing for who we are by raising money for kids. Um, and, um, other things that matter is how um, PC you are, you know, and I, I've, you know, I, I want to speak directly to the trans community, and it's like if I've said anything that 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 um, makes you feel disrespected, I feel really, really, really bad about that um, because I have a really. Um, Soft, I, ha I have a lot of empathy um, for the trans community. I just, and that is too, it's like fiercely trans men, like I teach yoga now, and I teach gay men's yoga, and I don't, trans men is just, it's just another man. And, and, and I'm gonna treat you just like another man. If you're competing for a contest, you need to be hot, you need to be interesting, you need to be fun. <laughs> You just can't show up and be, oh, well, I'm a little bit different in this way, so, you know, I need to get extra points. Um, uh, <laughs> that's, um, that's it. Well. <laughs> okay, great. Um, anyway. Okay, my last question for you is, what's the biggest misconception about you? I knew, yeah, I knew this was coming, and I, 
Um, I don't know. I try to be really, really honest. I don't know if there is... Um, I, I really said that thing about um, trans men in particular uh, because uh, I think there was some misconception there, um, which really bums me out. Um, <laughs> um, my biggest misconception about me... I don't know. I think I used to... Uh, I, I, uh, when I was trying to fit in, Rather than now, I just feel like I belong where I belong. I belong in this bar. I belong in the leather community. Um, and I'm not trying to fit in anymore. Um, but when I was trying to fit in, I um, was, uh, you know, I think I, something crossed my mind. Um, you know, I don't know. I would try to pretend like I know more than I do, and then you know. And the th fact is, I only know what I know. Um, I tried to uh, uh, pretend I had more experience than I did, and um, now I have more experience, and that's the only way you get it is by having experience. Um, I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know. Maybe um, people can bring things at me, but most of the things that people have said about me are true. And, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> if, if, yeah, if you're saying something about me that's true, then I need to either change that or, um, or uh, be okay with it. Well, Mike Gurley, I'd like to thank you for an amazing interview. Thank you. Thank you.